The Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. is proud to present Freedoms, Rights, and Responsibilities, a series of programs supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities' We the People initiative, dedicated to exploring significant themes and events in U.S. history and sharing the lessons with all Americans. Our next speaker is Felicia Bell. She's the Director of Education and Outreach at the United States Capitol Historical Society. She organizes educational programs such as lectures, youth forums, and college classes to promote and preserve the history of the Capitol and Congress. The current traveling exhibition from Frito's Shadow, African Americans in the United States Capitol, is Bell's curatorial debut. It commemorates the contribution of African Americans to the Capitol from the enslaved labor used to construct it to the current congressional representation in it. Prior to moving to Washington, D.C., Bell was the Director of Education and Programs at the Coastal Heritage Society in Savannah, Georgia. She graduated from Savannah State College, State University, excuse me, in 1998 with a bachelor's degree in history and from Savannah College of Art and Design in 2002 with a master's degree in historic preservation. She's currently a doctoral student in the Department of History at Howard University, where she's pursuing her research interest in, of enslaved labor in the Capitol, and her exhibition is still on view yes. at the Reginald Lewis Museum in Baltimore. Uh, I would suggest that if you are in Baltimore, you have to take the opportunity to go to the museum, our newest museum in the region, and see her exhibition, which is uh, in the lobby of the second floor. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Bell. Mr. Franklin for allowing me to speak tonight on my topic, um, and I hope you find it interesting. I want to start by um, showing you this image uh, that Mr. Gibbs referred to earlier, and um, my sources tell me that it's from an anti-slavery handbill that was printed in Philadelphia around 1817. And uh, let's see, he gave me a pointer here. Okay, I see, okay. Um, and this is the Capitol after uh, the burning during the War of 1812, so this would be 1814. You can see the burn marks above the uh, windows. And the uh, abolitionists are here. The enslaved people are here. Um, here at the top right corner are some celestial beings, and I want you to notice the liberty cap that is above her head. Uh, liberty caps were worn by free people in Rome um, to signify that you were not enslaved. Uh, this will come up later in the discussion. After it was ceded to Congress in 1788 and 1789, President George Washington quickly noted and I'm talking about, I'm sorry, I just skipped over there. I'm talking about um, uh, lands from Southern Maryland and Northern Virginia. Um, President George Washington quickly noted a plateau which stood 88 feet above the level of the Potomac River. Washington selected this site as the location of the capital. This is an image of Georgetown which was published in 1801 and I want you to notice the sparse population here, uh, the Capitol would have been behind this tree a little further in the landscape. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea of what the area would have looked like once the um, first uh, completed structure of the Capitol was, was finished. And we'll take a look at that a little later also. 
When Washington envisioned a national capital, he wanted it to be larger than Philadelphia and London. He quickly hired three commissioners to survey the land and oversee the design and construction of what is now the District of Columbia. Sorry, I think I, okay. Um, Benjamin Banneker, the son of a former enslaved person, joined the team led by Andrew Ellicott to survey the new federal district in 1791. A mathematician and astrologer, Banneker made celestial readings to keep surveying instruments correctly calibrated. Banneker lived in Maryland and published Albanacs in the 1790s that disproved notions of the racial inferiority of enslaved and free blacks. And this is um, an image of the cover of his almanac. This map was published in 1818 and shows the first design of the capital in the lower right corner. And this is, of course, the map of Federal City, L'Enfant's map. Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State, suggested to the commissioners to announce a nationwide design competition for the Capitol. And Dr. William Thornton, who's pictured here, was a Quaker from the island of Tortola in the British West Indies. He was a physician by training and an amateur architect. So he liked to draw for fun. So he wanted to join, he wanted to design this uh, Capitol and enter the competition because he also wanted to come to America. He entered his drawings into the competition, and after winning the competition, he won $500 and a lot of uh, property in the district. He was appointed commissioner of the District of Columbia and was the first architect of the Capitol, uh, appointed by President George Washington in 1794. So who will build this Capitol? Around, in surrounding areas, you have large plantations, tobacco in uh, Maryland and Virginia, you even have large plantations in South Carolina, North Carolina. So we might as well use enslaved labor. It's free, it's abundant, why not? This image I took from a publication called, it was a book called Popular History of the United States. And it's used a lot, um, I noticed, here in, in the district um, when referring to enslaved people. And so I wanted to find out, you know, what is this image about? So I actually um, found this book, and it was published in 1876, between 1876 and 1881. And I found the picture in there. And I'll just read a little passage from it. In February 1819, a bill was introduced in the House of Representatives for the admission of Missouri. James Talmadge, Jr. of New York proposed a condition of admission that from the moment there should be no personal servitude within the state except for those, except of those already held as enslaved people, and that these should be manumitted within a certain period. While the debate was in progress, a striking illustration of what the South was contending for, said Talmadge in his speech, and I quote, witnessed from the windows of Congress Hall and viewed by members who compose the legislative councils of Republican America, a slave driver, he said, a trafficker in human flesh, as if sent by providence, has passed the door of your capital on his way to the West, driving before him about 15 of these wretched victims of his power the males who might raise their arm of vengeance and retaliate for their wrongs were handcuffed and chained together while the females and children were marched in the rear under the guidance of the driver's whip, end quote. So when we have to recruit labor for the Capitol, I'm sure the commissioners were uh, thinking of how to do this and so uh, William Thornton, Dr. Thornton, who was the architect of the Capitol, uh, determined two schemes that he proposed to the other commissioners as to how to recruit labor. One scheme was to allow 50 intelligent Negroes to gain their freedom by earning wages while working on the Capitol project for six years. 
The other scheme was to purchase the enslaved men outright and free them after six years of work and training as stone cutters. There's no record of the board's response to these schemes and no record that anyone received uh, their freedom for working at the Capitol. Hiring out was a common practice in the Chesapeake area. Yeoman farmers who could not afford enslaved labor on a regular basis would hire enslaved laborers from large planters. These enslaved men would work as extra hands in the fields or do skilled labor. The yeoman farmer would pay the larger planter for, I'm, so, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the yeoman farmer would pay the larger planter for the labor and the money was often shared with the planter receiving the majority of the money um, with the enslaved laborer. In the case of the capital, each owner was paid $5 per month per enslaved person. Some of the enslaved laborers who were skilled, such as the sawyers, were given incentive pay. And this money was given to them directly so they were able to keep their money um, if you worked at nights, on Sundays, or on weekends. This is an um, image of the documents that I've been researching, and I wanted to share this with you just to show you the efficiency of these owners who are seeking payment for their labor that is hired out. And I'm sure you can't read it from where you sit, so I'll read it for you. It's addressed St. Mary's County, 10th July, 1798. Mr. Thomas Monroe, who is one of the commissioners at the time, Please pay unto Mr. Philip Power, the hire of Negro Ellick, for the first and second quarter of the present year. Yours, Joseph Turner. The commissioners, this is the bottom, this is the return. Um, now remember the top one is dated the 10th of July. So the bottom document, the commissioners, directed to Joseph Turner, 1798, July 12. For hire, Negro Ellick, 14 days in January in all the months of February, March, April, May, and June at $70 per annum, $32.04. Received payment from Thomas Monroe, 12 July 1798, signed Philip Power. So owners wrote vouchers to the commissioners seeking payment for their enslaved laborers who were hired out to the capital. The owners requested the payment to be made to other persons in some cases. Perhaps this was somebody they owed money to. Um, and the owners would pay that person per the request of the voucher. While the commissioners provided shelter and food uh, and physicians on site, owners were expected to provide clothing and shoes for their enslaved people. So picture here is a document of a receipt for shoes charged to the owner. And I'll read the document for you. Capital, it says at the very top. Thomas Cochran, for laborers, shoes, $10, paid by TM, that's Thomas Monroe, the, commis the commissioner, and charged to the proprietors of the laborers. I love the way they use these words, proprietors, and not, you know, slave owner. And um, you don't see the words um, slave in the documents. You see um, boy or my man or something to these effects. Nothing to blatantly say this person is enslaved, which I thought was interesting. So to finish it out, 31 March 1798, received payment of Thomas Monroe, signed Thomas Cox. Uh, some of the labor um, to build the capital included uh, cutting and hauling uh, stone, laying brick, digging ditches, forging nails, clearing land. Uh, most of the men worked 12-hour days, um, every day of the week, mostly. Um, I noticed in the timesheet, Sundays are, are not on the timesheet, so they rested on Sundays for the most part. Simple machines, pulleys, um, two-man hand saws, pit saws were used. Um, I looked at the National Weather Service records in the 19th century because I found that in 1795, in August, was the heavy construction month. Why? Because Congress was out of session. So 
Uh, I looked at recorded temperatures in the 19th century in August and found that temperatures reached 100 plus degrees in the federal city. So you can imagine what temperatures were like working 12 hour days in the outdoors. Enslaved people resisted oppression in many ways. They worked slower, they feigned illnesses or poisoned their owners. In the instance of the Capitol, there's a record of an enslaved person resisting by running away. Christina Hamilton placed this advertisement in the National Intelligencer in November 1827, offering a reward for Daniel Brown, who ran away from his labor at the Capitol. And I'll read it for you. $50 reward, ran away from the subscriber on Sunday, the 28th Ultimo, meaning the month before. A Negro man named Daniel who calls himself Daniel Brown. He is 23 years of age, about five feet nine inches high, very black, shows a pleasant countenance when spoken to, and has ears rather large than common, which stand off from his head, from the head. He has a wide mouth and shows his teeth very much when he talks or laughs, speaks rather quick, and as if his mouth was full, he was purchased about a year ago from Mr. Kirby of Prince George's County, Maryland, and has been employed of late as a laborer at the Capitol. When he absconded, he had on a black cloth coat and light corded pantaloons. The above reward and reasonable expenses will be paid for him if taken and secured out of the District of Columbia and Prince George's County, or $10 if taken within the limits of the latter and delivered to me, Christina Hamilton, residing near the capital, Washington City. The National Intelligence, sir, which is also was published in Washington, uh, in August, August 30th, 1822, reported the death of Nathaniel Bowen. And he was a free black laborer uh, who was killed on site. And I'll read the announcement. Fatal accidents, a laborer on the Capitol, a free colored man of the name of Daniel Bowen, Nathaniel Bowen, excuse me, was crushed to death on Wednesday last by the falling of a block of stone upon him of near two tons weight. The stone had been raised from its position in the dome for the purpose of setting it with more precision and was suspended by the pulleys 18 or 20 inches above its bed which the deceased was cleansing for its reception. In stooping to do this, he had placed some of his limbs and a part of his body under the block. And while in that situation, the lashings of the pulley gave way and the stone falling upon him put an instant period to his life. So I just wanted to show you uh, these two announcements so you can have an idea of resistance at the Capitol and also the hazardous work site um, that was involved and, and these men risking their lives to build this colossal neoclassical architectural structure. In late 1800, Congress moved into the north wing of the Capitol and that's what's pictured here. And this is a watercolor by William Birch. The sandstone used to build the uh, Capitol in this structure particularly uh, came from Choir Creek in Stafford County, Virginia. The laborers in the foreground, you'll notice, here are using simple machines. You see the handsaw here, um, probably more like a mallet here being used. You know, just simple machine, machines, large blocks of stone here, just to give you an idea um, of what labor was like at this point of the capital's construction. After, building, after the building stone was brought to the site, free and enslaved laborers assisted European-born stone cutters, carvers, and setters who dressed and set the sandstone, and skilled enslaved laborers are listed on the timesheets along with white carpenters, sawyers, and masons. Sculptor and founder Clark Mills owned the foundry in Bladensburg, Maryland. Mills sculpted the equestrian statue of Andrew Jackson in Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C., which was the first bronze statue in the United States.
the commissioners granted Mills a commission to cast the Statue of Freedom, which is atop the Capitol Dome. He also owned several enslaved people, including Philip Reed. He purchased Philip Reed in Charleston, South Carolina. He also has um, a studio that was in Charleston, South Carolina, where he worked sometimes. According to Mills records, Philip Reed was 42 years old, a mulatto man who was exceptionally skilled, short, and in good health. According to the December 10, 1863 issue of the New York Tribune, an Italian artisan at the Capitol wanted additional pay and guaranteed work for mantling and dismantling the Statue of Freedom. And Philip Reed is quoted as saying, I can do that well. His familiarity with casting was especially keen because he had been working at the foundry for several years. So he actually cast the Statue of Freedom. He, along with other workers that Mills owned. And the timesheets indicate that Clark Mills and his enslaved men worked five weeks in September and October 1860 for one hour per day, except on Sundays. And Philip Reed earned $1.25 per day, and a total of $38.75 and this is the receipt for Philip Reed's labor. And you'll see the dollar 25 cents here. And these are the days he worked. And this is what he did, keeping up fires under the moles. Founding is a very um, hazardous type of labor. Enslaved labor is very interesting because no matter where you go, um, there's no region associated with easy labor. Because you have, um, you know, turpent, you know, making uh, turpentine and getting that from pine trees—that's hard labor. Um, you have cotton and you have rice, and here you have founding. And so this is uh, keeping up molds involved, staying awake all night, and you have to keep that fire under the molds in order to get the, um, in order to, you know, get the mold of the um, of the statue made. So. And you have to have the mold in order to cast the bronze on it. So anybody who knows anything about pottery, um, you know, would know that it, it takes a lot. Um, so it was a very arduous labor that he did. And this is an image of the actual foundry, Clark Mills Foundry, and this was taken in 1862. And um, as I said, it was located outside of Ladensburg. April 16, 1862. Uh, the D.C. Emancipation Act provided compensation to owners for their loss of property. And Clark Mills' um, petition for payment described Philip Reed as smart in mind, a good workman, and a foundry. Even though Mills valued Reed at $1,500, which you see here, the very bottom, and you see the other enslaved people. He had some women, some men, but Philip Reed was valued the highest. But even though he was valued at $1,500, the law, the Emancipation Act, only allowed $300 per person who was filing a petition. And Cong the reason why is that Congress reasoned that slave owners who were loyal to the Union, you remember the Civil War is going on at this time, uh, were entitled to compensation, unlike those in the rebellious states in the South. So D.C. Emancipation Day was April 16th, and it was celebrated publicly every year from 1866 to 1901 in Washington. And it became an official holiday in the district when Mayor Anthony Williams signed the legislation on January 4th, 2005. And this is an image of some folks celebrating Emancipation Day in Washington in 1866. The final section of freedom was lifted atop the Capitol Dome on December 2nd, 1863, to the sound of the 35-gun salute from Washington's surrounding forts. And freedom stands at 19 feet 6 inches tall and weighs approximately 15,000 pounds. Freedom is poised at 288 feet above the East Front Plaza on a cast iron pedestal, and she costs $23,796.82. That's excluding the cost of her installation. <laughs>